Hi everyone, welcome to this week's episode of No Such Thing as a Fish. It is the super long bank holiday for the Queen's Jubilee and so we have decided that we are going to take a weekend off and instead this week you're going to get another one of my compilations from all the best bits from the last year or so of Fish uh, which didn't make it into the final show because they were too silly, because they got the facts wrong or just basically because there wasn't enough space. Um, since it's the Queen's Jubilee I can guarantee that for once this compilation doesn't contain anything libelous to the British royal family but I can't guarantee it won't for the next one. So you better make the most of this, uh, your Royal Highness, if you're listening. Anyway, just one more quick thing before we start this week's show. And that is that we have a couple of live dates coming up. Uh, They will be in Inverness, Edinburgh, Aberdeen, Glasgow and Cardiff. They are postponed gigs from earlier in the year that will be happening towards the end of August and the start of September. We would love to see you there. If you live in any of those places, then get your tickets fast if you don't live in any of those places but you can get to those places then get the tickets as well because it's going to be a whole lot of fun loads of facts loads of silliness and the best way to get your tickets is to go to qi.com slash fish events anyway hope you enjoy this week's show and what else is there to say but on with the podcast mike tess from dennis hello hello <laughs> mike tess from harkin hello 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 mike tess from andy hello 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 what an awesome chat we're having. Hello, hello, hello. Yeah, he's been trying to think of puns based on TV shows um, and dogs. Heel, heel or no heel. The Barkfest show. Oh, yeah, show. heel or no heel. Yeah. Oh, Barkfest, Barkfest is a good... Yeah, yeah. I'm trying to do something with one of the biggies like Newsnight or whatever. Can we do Why don't you just... Newsbite. Right, come on. <laughs> Newsbite. Very nice. There we go. Off we, <laughs> off we pop. <laughs> he's been sat there for 20 minutes trying to think of that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we good? So Are we recording? Ready. We're recording. Hello and welcome to another episode of No Such Thing as a Fish, a weekly podcast coming to you from the QI offices in Covent Garden. My name is Dan Schreiber. I am sitting here with Andrew Hunter-Murray, James Harkin and Anna Tashinsky. And once again, we have gathered around the microphones with our four favorite facts from the last James seven Harkin. days. <laughs> <laughs> And in no particular order, here we go. Starting with fact number one, that is Barkin. (laughs) 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 One thing I found on Alan Withy's page is a thing that he thinks might be the first ever beard and mustache show. And this was in 1873. (laughs) Yeah, members of the public came to watch bearded men stand on a stage and have their beards judged. Um, Ah. Yeah, so this was set up by a guy called William Holland, and it happened in London. It had quite a bit of um, momentum behind it. Journalists who couldn't make it to the day because they were busy were writing in, trying to influence the judges, saying a beard has to be like this, and it, you know, giving opinion pieces about who a winner should be. So they thought it was going to be massive, and it really, really wasn't. It was um, (laughs) barely attended. They thought they were going to have 30 entrants to it, including Mr. Charles Chaplin, who sent in fragments of his beard because he couldn't physically be there um it's definitely not what chris it, did charlie chaplin have a beard i, I thought he had a mustache exactly he says in brackets in his article but unlikely to be that charles chaplin and i agree because this oh. happened 16 years before chaplin was born um <laughs> okay so <laughs> he couldn't even enter evidence. the beautiful baby competition <laughs> should, should we get onto some more steady ground and start talking about poos <laughs> As it Sorry, feels man. like <laughs> that's more kind of our direction usually. Um, All right, bring us onto solid can ground. I, can I just say solid ground? Yeah. Can I can I say that um, that sometime today uh, I got a text from Dan being like, just heads up, um, these are all the facts on coprolites we've already covered. <laughs> <laughs> Bloody podcast! <laughs> Where it's literally they've got a ma- 
massive Excel list of all the coprolite facts that, 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 that wasn't on any of the other facts. Not on, you know, Amelia Earhart. Not on <laughs> just, just on coprolite. Just, it's quite impressive. It You're was so amazing. right. Yeah. That was pretty outrageous that we've never mentioned Amelia Earhart before, but we have mentioned coprolites 50 different times. Yeah. <laughs> I think they, wow. they come out of the tunnels to mates, don't they, moles? I think that's one yes. weird thing oh. about them. Um, so they because you can't really have sex inside a tiny little tunnel, so you have to come outside. So you could say they're mounting out of the mole hill, couldn't you? Yes. <laughs> yes. Why, why, have, why have they not built a big sex dungeon in the mole burrows? Dan, I think, They've got sorry, the birth room. Dan, I, th- I think you missed my pun just there. <laughs> they're mal- oh. mounting out of the yes. mole hill. Did you? That's why they haven't <laughs> built it. Yes, so that we can make puns about them. The moles are very big on comedy puns. Oh dear. <laughs> um, Torval and Dean were oh, yeah. um, oh, figure skaters. Famous. Ah. And who, are they, who are they again? I know their name. I know they skate, but in what context do they skate? Were they professionals or were they an entertainment oh, thing? Yeah. Yeah. They won the gold medal at yeah. the Sarajevo Olympics, right. whatever that was. Jane, Jane Torville and Christopher, Christopher Dean. Christopher. And, and for Britain or for, for Britain? Yeah. Britain, yeah, that's basically why big, they're really, big really a big, big deal, deal here. Yeah. Yeah. Probably international listeners are thinking, who the hell are Torville and Dean? But guys, they're a huge deal here because, uh, yeah, they, everyone loved them. They won at the Winter Olympics in the 80s. And I always thought they were a husband and wife. And oh. no. Oh, um, um, they, d- um uh, cousins, father, father and daughter, <laughs> <laughs> brothers. <laughs> You've got it. Uh, no, it's uh, actually d- detective and villain. <laughs> <laughs> One of them's there, and the other ones are picking up basket. <laughs> It's none of the above. It's okay. nothing. It's owner and pet. No, it's nothing. It's uh. they were just friends, and they've snogged once at the back of a bus when they were fourteen before they were even partners. Oh, okay. And then that was the end. And they were just really great friends. But they had to spend so much of their lives together. So they yeah. both say their spouses took it took a lot to persuade them that this was okay. Right. And right. they, I think, just it was only shortly before they won gold that they gave up their jobs. I think he was a policeman and she was a worked in insurance. So he was a detective. <laughs> 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 he said when they got it they I think when they, when they won when they won I think it was one of the most watched TV programs ever yeah. in Britain it was massive and Dean said afterwards or said in an interview since that the moment that he won it and, and they won it and breaking all of these records so they got perfect scores throughout which no one had ever got before and he said nothing had ever affected him so much in his life and then he specifically said sure having children is a life changing event but this was the crowning moment and I wonder why his partner thinks that <laughs> <laughs> um, do you know who the first Europeans, I should say, to climb um, Kilimanjaro were? No. Mm. Um, so they were called Meyer and Perchella, and they climbed it in 1889. But to celebrate the 100 year celebration, they decided um, who this is, the organizing committee, it just says in my notes, I don't know who that is, but they decided to um, award posthumous certificates to the African porters who helped them to get to the top. Because obviously yes. they didn't go by themselves. So they went to this um, village called Marangu, which is near the bottom of the mountain. And they asked the locals, you know, do you know who did this? And they went, oh, this guy did it. And there's a guy called Yohani Kinyala Lau, um, who apparently had taken yeah. these guys to the top 100 years earlier when he was 18 years old. <laughs> oh, <laughs> no. So he was given the certificate, despite the fact that if he was that person he would be the oldest man who ever lived <laughs> um, he continued to live for another seven years which means that if this was the guy he died at the age of 125 which would make him the oldest person male or female to have ever lived by three years wow I believe it <laughs> it's possible is, yeah <laughs> I mean gosh that Maybe. clean mountain air really is good for you isn't it <laughs> The other option is he was nine years old when he went up and oh. was just under the oldest person ever. But no, right. it's we, probably a misremembrance. It, it sounds probably, like a lie. It, it sounds like him. <laughs> there was a baby born at an Irish petrol station this year. It was in Kildare and um, it was awarded free petrol for a year. The baby was? Well, I, his parents, <laughs> I guess. Wow. <laughs> That's great. 
Yeah. That, so it that wasn't like, cool. you know, yeah. sometimes people get christening presents <laughs> of a case of champagne and, you know, they can't enjoy it for 18 years. It's not one of those. It's been kept in the cellar for when the baby turned 17. <laughs> Quite the reverse. <laughs> <laughs> they have to do maximum driving. These parents have to be driving as much as they possibly can in the area of the service station. Right. I'm going to tell you a sort of similar fact, which none of you are going to care about or have any interest in whatsoever. But I guarantee you there's a slither of audience that might care. There was a massive show that came out on Netflix uh, last year called Selling Sunset. Huge show on Netflix and it has a big following and it's all about real estate agents in America. And they're all sort of very beautiful Hollywood characters in it, right? They all have really odd names, like one called Amanza. I just haven't heard Amanza before. Not Amanda, Amanza. And then there's a lady called Chriselle, right? Again, very weird name. Turns out the reason Chriselle is called that is because her mum went into labor at a Shell petrol station <laughs> and she was delivered there by a member of staff called Chris. That's beautiful. <laughs> wow. So she became Chris Shell. Now, it means nothing to you three here, but I'm telling you, it's just blown the minds <laughs> of about six people. <laughs> Had a really embarrassing thing when I was staying in Sussex last year where um, there was a post box, which I thought was a post box that it looked like a red post box. So I thought it was somewhere <laughs> oh, where you post letters. Oh, and it was happened? like outside the house so i thought oh my god this is so cool the royal mail have installed a post box but like in the property of this tiny little cottage and so i posted a few letters into it and then the owner of the property i was renting off came and delivered them back to me about three days later i was like so you seem to have got these letters in my post box which is where oh, so it's the letter post- it's the letter box for the house it's the letter oh, box for the house god. yeah because what i thought you were going to say is every couple of years you see it in the tabloids of some old man who like for 25 years has been posting his letters in a dog poo bed <laughs> like literally <laughs> it's such a common story <laughs> they did smell pretty bad when she gave them back come to think of it <laughs> So one of the people who was trapped in Wuhan in China when it got shut down because of coronavirus was a, a Mr. Bean impersonator who <laughs> happened to be there. He was he was at a lab, wasn't he? And yeah. uh, he left a fridge open. <laughs> yes. oh, no. <laughs> He's a oh, British comic goodness. called Nigel Dixon, mm. and his job for a living is that he impersonates Mr. Bean. So he's extraordinarily popular in China right now since the pandemic happened. On Weibo, he's got hundreds of millions of views for each of the videos that he puts up. He basically did all these videos about how to treat lockdown, you know, how to stay healthy in lockdown. So all done with the Mr. Bean suit on, you know, the tie. It was it was him being Mr. Bean on this thing. But one of the things that he then did sort of as himself without Mr. Bean is he released a video which reportedly was him delivering propaganda about the fact that the chi- that China was doing fantastic in the pandemic. And this was in early 2020. So he said things like, once people were waiting for hospital beds, now beds are waiting for people. And it sickens me to hear of other countries blaming China. But for what? We're now hearing of cases where people around the world have contracted their virus with no obvious connections to China. And this was a part of a state propaganda channel Uh, an official channel with China. So basically, because Mr. Bean as a TV show, Mm -hmm. and I say this as someone who grew up in Hong Kong, um, Han Dao Xianshan, he is ginormous in China. This guy, they suddenly had their own Mr. Bean who could be used as propaganda. And wait a minute, doesn't Mr. Mr. Bean doesn't talk, does he? I thought that was the whole point of Mr. Bean. (laughs) <laughs> oh, 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 oh. Oh, oh. I must say, uh, the Chinese government really has done a very, very wonderful job. <laughs> wow, that is very depressing. Yeah, well, he's massive there, and it was lucky for them because he was trapped literally at the heartbeat of coronavirus in Wuhan, and he defended them. Uh, and we don't know if that was just him defending them on his own or whether or not it was because he was making it specifically for Xianhua, a news agency, which is an official Chinese state-run media agency. Who knows? We don't know. Well, that's us legally covered, Dan. Thank you for <laughs> throwing yourself on that embarrassing hand grenade. Stop the podcast! Stop the podcast! Uh, hi, Dan, or should I say... Hoi. Hoi. <laughs> Oi, James. Good morning to you, or should I say... Goedemorgen. Goedemorgen. 
Oh, the modern back at you. James, what the hell is going on? I am using the app Bubble, and it's teaching me my first two words in the Dutch language. Wow, that's so exciting. Can you say no such thing as a fish? It's not one of my first two words. I wonder if your neighbour might be Dutch and we could work out how to say, can you stop drilling, please? That's I, that's actually me. I'm just doing some drilling while we're doing the ad. <laughs> Multitasking is my new thing. Multitasking. Well, the great thing about Bubble is they have 15-minute lessons. So you can actually do loads of other stuff and then just take your 15 minutes, do your Bubble lesson, and then carry on with what you were doing. That's right. They have all sorts of amazing technology to allow you to learn languages in the quickest way possible. They've got podcasts that just help you to perfect the language. It's the perfect place to go to to start learning the languages of the world. That's right. And right now, Bubble is offering our listeners six months for free with the purchase of a six-month subscription. So if you want to learn Italian, Spanish, French, German, a whole host of languages, then do that and use the promo code FISH. That's right. So head to uk.babble.com slash play. Use that offer code FISH and you will be able to get six months free with a purchase of a six month subscription. That's right. uk.babble, B-A-B-B-E-L dot com forward slash play, promo code FISH. And Dan? Totsins. Totsins. Oh, tot scenes, James. On with the podcast. On with the show. Um, here's the thing. Here's a puzzle for you all. Um, it's a word you have to guess. Five letters. It's G R A blank blank. G R. Is this your is, James? Are you trying to do an audio version of word? <laughs> Once a week, this is going to be the next big thing. Uh, okay, this is going to be great. Are the two? Okay, okay. Uh, I'll say, I'll say, grass. Straight in there. Anyone? Do you want us to say grape. grave? Grape. I wanted you to say whatever you wanted to say, but now you've said grave, Anna. Yeah. Um, that signifies a high mortality salience in you, uh, not in Dan and Andy. Uh, and apparently this is a test that psychologists use to see how much you're thinking about your own mortality. And what you can find is that people who think more about their own mortality tend to be more conservative. Mm. So um, the idea is that the, the more you think about death, the more you kind of try and conserve your own worldview and the more kind of entrenched you are in, in the current you know, system. Not saying that this is you, Anna, but this is the idea of the researchers. Wow. Uh, and they said that people who did this test and went for grave as opposed to grass or grape, um, if they were asked to set bail, like pretend to be a judge and set bail for a supposed prostitute, then they would give an average bail of $455 compared to $50 who would set uh, the people who would have said grass or grape. So you're a much more conservative person in th according to these researchers. To be fair, James, when I said the word grass just there, what I actually was thinking of was a, a patch of grass on the plot <laughs> uh, of land where my mortal remains will be buried. So yeah, yeah. I don't know if that's... Dad uh, was thinking that like, in the way that people crush grapes with their feet to make wine, so death is crushing above us and pushing us down and down deeper into the earth before <laughs> we meet our maker. Now, I was oh, thinking I about, like, I love green grapes. Um... <laughs> <laughs> on uh, actually silly mountaineering clothes, do you remember in 2016 on International Women's Day what a group of Chinese mountaineers did? No. <laughs> A group of Chinese male mountaineers to celebrate climbed up, um, climbed up a mountain wearing dresses and heels in order to experience the struggles and strife of being a woman. But yeah, they wore like hot pants and mini skirts. Hot pants. Hot pants. Yeah. So I don't think it was quite the same outfits as people in the 1700s. Suspenders. Yeah. yeah. This is what all the women that I've seen on the internet wear. <laughs> exactly. They were all wearing very high stilettos and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> all going, God, it really is hard being a woman climbing a mountain, isn't wow, it? Wow, this branch of string fellas at the top are better be worth it. <laughs> What an, as James, you were saying, extraordinary character, Peter O'Toole. His his stories are very wild. He was a very, uh, particularly in his younger years, a tour de force of of partying and and booze and um, Lotharioism. He was he was just a big old character. He accidentally, in a boating accident, uh, cut the top of his finger off, and so he put the tip of his finger into some brandy and then he pushed it back into place and wrapped it with a bandage and then weeks later he removed it and found that he'd put it back on the wrong way round 
And that's where the story ends. And I don't know, <laughs> I've looked at photos, I don't see a backward finger on Peter O'Toole. Was it na- sort of nail in or upside down? That's, see, the story just doesn't give us any of... more. Yeah, it's hard to... No, I think it must be backwards. So let's imagine Back the nail front. would be, yeah, facing front. front. It doesn't say how much of the finger it was either. Right? Exactly. It could have been just the very, very, very tip. Like I've cut the very tip of my finger, right? Exactly. It might not but have been yeah, the whole you... nail. Exactly. But you would Couldn't assume tell, if, if it was, it was just... very, very tip, you wouldn't tell it was the wrong exactly. way Exactly. You kind of need so, a distinguishing feature, don't you? Like a nail. That's true. Yeah. yeah. If, you, if, you could, if, you, if you heard him drumming his fingers on the table, would you get three taps and then a squelch as the soft yeah. head at the front? Yeah. <sighs> loved, loved. I don't know if he loved a fight, but he certainly was in them enough to have some opinion that was probably, you know, in favour of... <laughs> Otherwise, you might avoid it. But it just seems like he was just That's constantly... Good do, you think Dan? do you think he's going to sue, Dan? I mean, he's been dead since 2000 and something. He's, we're fine. Well, was it was to... a hell of a sentence. I loved it. <laughs> I didn't give up as well. I kept, I kept going. Imagine. But I, I think his kids are going to get in touch going, he did not love a fight. He quite liked a fight. <laughs> <laughs> but I read... So I found he was very good friends uh, with Brian Blessed, another great actor. Oh, was and he? Great. Very good friends. And I read an article where Brian was talking about his relationship with Peter O'Toole. And basically, and it's a very long article, every single encounter ended up with Brian beating the shit out of him. That was the, <laughs> the thread of it. And it even starts with him beating someone else up when he first meets Peter O'Toole. So he says um, that they first met at a party in the mid-50s, these are his words, where I'd memorably just punched Harold Pinter's lights out. Um, <laughs> he got one right on the side of the jaw. And Peter O'Toole comes over and says, wow, that's really good. And then Peter O'Toole, because he's this drunken man, anytime he was on set with Brian Blessed on various movies, Brian would just beat him up. And there's cases of him dragging him around the house as he was crying and throwing his arms around. And and But Peter Peter O'Toole supposedly loved him. He said he was the only person who was, you know, properly honest and loved him. And they were very it good. It actually sounds like, are you sure that Peter O'Toole loved a fight? What you've described there is the fact that Brian Blessed was a very violent man. <laughs> <laughs> so if, you, if you'd if you actually given my very interestingly long sentence a chance earlier, what I was trying to say was he was always he in fights, fought. which makes it suggest that he likes a fight, even though he was not necessarily the one instigating it. Otherwise, or at least not... at least he had an opinion on it. At least like, he, he had, had an opinion, opinion on it. Um, one last thing on um, middle finger is if you do ASL, American Sign Language, um, then you can kind of make what you're saying profane by doing it with your middle finger. So, for instance, if you do the sign for mother. But instead of using, instead of pointing with the fingers you're supposed to point with, you point with your middle finger. It means motherfucker, for instance. Ah, um, and there's a few other things, like for instance, the sign for um, a hearing person is kind of you do a little gesture around your mouth, uh, and if you do it with your middle finger, then it's like saying fucking hearing people. Do you know what I mean? It's oh, a way nice. of saying like that what you want to say is actually quite profane. Uh, and they think this might be quite a new thing because there is a very old ASL symbol, which is having your um, your forearm facing upwards and then doing the middle finger. And that is the sign for the Sears Tower or the CN Tower in North America, those two big buildings. Uh, basically, you have to do the middle finger and that is the sign for the, for those buildings. For the CN... Are the- so the, the CN t- so the CN Tower in Seattle or the Sears Tower, which is in, I think, Chicago, but I can't remember. If you want to do a sign for that, you basically just do the <laughs> finger. Do you think uh, that's because that's the CN amazing. Tower is CNT? It's kind of like... <laughs> <laughs> it really is not that. It's because it's got, <laughs> it's got a spiky bit at the top. <laughs> yeah, yeah, whatever. I'm going to assume it's calling someone the C word. That is, wow. That's rude. <laughs> Um, my favourite river that I've recently read about is um, the Congo River, only because it's so unfathomably deep. And I kind of mean unfathomably literally there. <laughs> so it's the deepest river in the world. It's 220 metres deep. But at the bottom, there's no light can penetrate that low. And I realised that if you put all of London into the deepest bit of the Congo River, only six buildings would poke out of the top of it. Wow. So the last building you see the tip of is the cheese grater. That's 225 metres. And then the rest of us are all submerged. 
is the shard is the shard submerged? Yeah, yeah. Shard, no, no. Shards up. Shards taller. Shards the oh, okay. highest, I think, tallest. Mm. Yeah. Wow. Um, but yeah, so we do. If that does happen, we all have to flee to the top of the shard. I guess. <laughs> I think that's going to be the least of our problems if all of the buildings in London get taken to the Congo <laughs> River. I don't know how it's how we've woken up with this situation <laughs> being as it is, but. <laughs> You just got to deal with it. That's really cool. That's good. Yeah, I don't think of rivers being anywhere near that deep. And I guess the point is that most of them are not, but this yeah. one is. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you can't I'm... touch the bottom, Andy, even on tiptoes. <laughs> and there was advice literature um, about beards that you could get back in the day um, in the in the time of the beard mania. <laughs> uh, and one of the best ones, according again to Dr. Withy, was um, Don't, a manual of mistakes and improprieties more or less prevalent in conduct and speech. And this was like a little pamphlet on every page it told you stuff you weren't allowed to oh. do. At no stage did it tell you what you could do instead. It only told you what you couldn't do. Uh, and on one page it says that if men have beards or whiskers, you should be careful um, to wash them after smoking and should not get in the habit of pulling your whiskers adjusting your hair or otherwise fingering yourself sensible advice then sensible advice now <laughs> yeah <laughs> some things don't age but what am i supposed to do with these fingers <laughs> the funny thing about omelets is that i've had maybe 20 30 maybe even 40 different kinds of omelet they all have tasted the same I've never had an omelet <laughs> that i can differentiate I, this really. is a taste bud thing isn't it yeah. athena i mean that sounds like you need to get your taste buds looked at. But specifically, a cheese omelette, mushroom omelette, spinach <laughs> omelette, it, it's just all egg to me. Do you, yeah. you feel that way? I kind no, of do feel that me. way, actually. It's you can some... taste the mushroom within it, right? But... but at the same time, it just I think what the egg does is it overpowers everything. So it doesn't matter what you put in it. It's just an omelette. It is powerful. You should try eggless omelette. That's what you need. Oh, just... that's the cheese sandwich. That's what that is, and it's better. <laughs> On the Challenger expedition, which I had never read about, they collected 4,800 new species, and they found the Marianas Trench on that expedition. That's uh, incredible. Yeah. Did they just have seven miles of cable or whatever it was? Um, I actually don't know how... Sonar, I think, maybe? Yeah. In the maybe. 1880s? Yeah, no, so it was yeah, weird. Maybe. Mm. I'm not sure. That's incredible. It's Yeah, yeah. It was... I can't remember anything about it, but it does sound like an amazing expedition. Yeah. 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 Maybe it was I once dropped a uh, can of oh, yeah. Coke into the ocean, uh, very shallow, and it hit the bottom and came back up. So maybe that's what they did. Maybe they what? had sort of a... What are you even talking about? <laughs> well, maybe they got over the Marianas Trench, dropped Sorry. a can was of it, soda was over... Was it Diet Coke? It was... I can't remember, actually. Because Diet maybe. Coke floats and normal Coke sinks. Ah, so it must have was been normal Was it sealed? Coke. Yeah, sealed. Yeah. Hang on, it went to the bottom, then it came back up again. Yeah. And you're suggesting that maybe they timed how long it took to come back. <laughs> I'm just trying to spitball how this happened, and I just know that I've had practical experience with... Uh... Did that? What, what practical experience have you had, Andy? Well... <laughs> yeah, people in no, glass I've never, houses. I've never <laughs> dropped saying, Compared to the rest of us, Dan is an expert in this, <laughs> with his one experiment. Exactly. So hang on, it went all the way to the bottom. Who knows? No, no, no. You, you know, because this is your experiment. It went yeah. all the way to the bottom and then came all the way back up to the top. Well, what I did was I did it in a swimming pool and then in shallow water. And then when we were out on a boat, we put a Coke can <laughs> in. It disappeared for something like five minutes and then it bobbed back up. That's really interesting. It could be a change in pressure, I guess. It could be an octopus holding it. <laughs> <laughs> Read the back. Hate Diet Coke. <laughs> Tossed it back up. Why has Diet Coke never come down? What's going on? <laughs> that, wow. But that's yeah. proper science, that I would say. That is proper science. Yeah, um, yeah you, you would have been on this expedition. <laughs> I'm not suggesting this is a real thing. <laughs> Do you know where the largest man-made waterfall in the world is? Do you know oh, who owns man it? Man-made? Who owns who, who, the largest man-made waterfall in the world? So we're more likely to get who owns it rather than where it is, is what you're saying. Yeah, is it a squillionaire okay. who we've heard of? Uh, yes. Oh. Okay. Have they recently been to space? They have not. Musk. Okay. Elon Musk. No. Bill Gates. No, think of someone who has got no taste whatsoever. Trump. 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 You're kidding. How did you all get that straight away? <laughs> Amazing. I, I feel like that clue was too easy to get. Um, this is at the Trump National Westchester Golf Course. And basically every one of his courses has a fake waterfall. And each one is more tacky than the previous. Wow. And they're so huge. If you're playing anywhere near them, you can't hear anyone speak because there's so much water going over the top of them. Um, and this um, 
this one at Westchester is the world's biggest. I, there is one at Changi Airport, which okay. looks really big to me <laughs> and possibly could be bigger. But according to Guinness Book of Records, this is the biggest. Wow. Okay. Uh, what, do you know how tall it is? Did you say? Uh, I don't. I think it's 5,000 gallons go over every minute or second because I'm wow. going off memory. But okay. there's a lot Working of Working out from that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but another fake waterfall um, can be found in Australia and can be seen on our TV from time to time. Can you guess where that might be? Credits of Neighbours. No. The it's Herbal Essence is advert. It's, in a, it's, it's on, TV, <laughs> on TV and it's in Australia. So when do we see Australia Oh, so TV? maybe Air is Rock. Is there like a weird bit of water that the, comes the down? Water comes there? down there occasionally, but Air's Rock, I don't know if you know, or Uluru is not a fake rock. <laughs> so hang on. It's a fake rock that we see on our TV a fake, sometimes. A fake waterfall. Fake waterfall. Fake waterfall. But there's in Australia that's on British TV sometimes. Very famous waterfall. Very famous. famous. Our but it's fake. <laughs> It's fake. It's a, is it known that it's fake, or is this a secret you're busting open? Um, I'm not busting it wide open, but I think some people know. Uh, uh, the, the Sydney Opera House. Is, is not a waterfall. No, but I, I, wonder if, I bet I there's wonder a wonder feature wrong. somewhere. <laughs> I, I bet panicked, it's big. I panicked. We've been there. Yeah, I didn't see We've a waterfall. Been, oh, um, I just, I'm just naming things in Australia now. Yeah, uh, give us a, give Crocodile us a tiny Dundee bit more. With like the, there's often an um, attractive young TV personality underneath it. Neighbours? No. It's that, what? What? No, but you can't just say neighbours. Oh, 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 oh! I'm a celebrity. I know you are, Andy. But do you know the name of this show? <laughs> okay, so I'm a celebrity. Get me out of here. Yes. We so see. they have that kind of place where they all go for a shower underneath a waterfall, oh. and it turned out recently they found out that this is a completely fake waterfall, and they can turn the taps on and off whenever they no. want to. No. You're kidding. And whenever anyone goes for a waterfall shower, they just turn the taps on and they get washed. That is brilliant. Do, do wow. they that was like Mylene Class literally turning a hot water no, tap? No, it's, the, the, uh, it's the producers. Produ- yeah, producers. What a that. shame about what. A shower that would be so yeah. which poor producer has to stand there watching the dry waterfall 24 hours a day in case someone stands under it <laughs> it's I, I guess it's not that bad a job is it it's, it's one for an intern yeah. I think <laughs> <laughs> it's really sad though because President McKinley used to genuinely really love handshakes he used to it said that he it was the, it was his favourite thing to do was shake people's hands mm. and this guy basically used it as a as a tactic as a you know a way yeah because it was, it was him close. that was killed this way yeah. right McKinley yeah. 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 yeah, and he was killed. Yeah. It was it was at a um, fun fair, wasn't it? He was he was at the Not Buffalo. A fun fair. Well, it was like the Buffalo <laughs> World Fair. Um, so it was one of those places. <laughs> Sorry, Dan, there's a really big difference between fun fairs and the Buffalo World. They fair. were they were fun. I think is you know, it was fun yeah. space fair. Dan was just using it as a descriptor. It was a fun fair, not for William McKinley, like, but for everyone else. There. It's like the fun fair down at Finsbury Park, as opposed to you know this massive world fair where they were showing off you know American industry and like Bell or whoever else was. Yeah. My poor kids. Yeah, this is fun. This is fun. Dad. Speaking of concrete, there was a woman called Sarah Guppy. Uh, and in 1811 she invented a new way of making piling for bridges so when you make a bridge you need to kind of fire some stuff into the ground so they'll hold it solid and put some concrete in there to make the foundations and so she came up with a new way of doing this and she was a friend of Isambard Kingdom Brunel and so Brunel basically used all of her um, piling tactics for all of his bridges Um, But she didn't patent it um, because she said, it is unpleasant to speak of oneself. It may seem boastful, particularly in a woman. Hmm. So she decided not to patent it. And this kind of technique was used in a load of bridges. Come on, guppy. She did come up with a few things that she did patent. So she um, came up with a method of keeping ships free of barnacles, which made her 40 (laughs) grand from the government because it was so important. Wow. Um, I mean, that's so important, that as well. Exactly. Not a lot of money for how important that is. She must have identified there was a guppy in the market. A gap in the market. Yeah, no, no, yeah, we did get it. No, no, Sorry, no, guppy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Cool. Feels like it's not the right guppy pun when we're talking about ships and water. <laughs> 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 Here's another quite French um, French politician, uh, Gaston Daffer. Uh, and he was a participant <laughs> in the last duel that ever took place in France. This was in 1967. And Daffer had Whoa. insulted a René Ribière in the French parliament. He'd said... Um, which means apparently shut up stupid 
Uh, and so they decided they were going to have a duel. Uh, and Defer ba- vowed that he wouldn't kill Ribiere because it was the night before his wedding that they'd organised this duel. Um, but he said, I will only wound you and spoil your wedding night very considerably. Otherwise, it wouldn't be Defer. <laughs> Just <Defer's>. stunning. <laughs> And James, what was the upshot of the duel? Uh, so the fair won, but it was a couple of he. There were a couple of nicks that he put on Riviere. He wasn't like a, he didn't chop his penis off or anything. It was just like a, okay. few, a few cuts. And then the guy who was officiating the duel, who was France's Secretary of State for Foreign Affairs, <laughs> decided <laughs> this is enough. Enough's enough. We're going to call it a win for for the fair. I've actually been up a lookout tree. Um, oh, yeah. Cool. yeah, so in Australia, um, sort of south of Perth, there is um, three trees. The Dave Evans Bicentennial Tree, there's the Gloucester Tree and the Diamond Tree. I don't know which one I was up because I went as a kid, it's like 10 or so. So basically, the way you get up these trees is that they slammed in these metal bars and they would go circular around it and you would climb to the top and then you'd have that hut there. And um, it was petrifying, but I had sort of kid confidence to get up to the top. And you yeah. climb, and so you climb on these metal bars. You're sort of climbing on all fours. Yeah, you're climbing right. on all fours, and there's nothing underneath you. Like there's no, <laughs> you there's em- no meshing. Were you employed by the Forestry Commission. Or? They open it up to the public, so it's oh. no longer a used tree, and uh, for those purposes, and so tourists can just rock up and go. And they say, don't go up if you're afraid of heights, or if you might have a heart attack, yeah. or okay. if you're <laughs> if you're a kid. I don't know why I was allowed up. And I do remember we went to the top, my sister and I, and there was a couple sitting, shivering petrified in the corner of the the hut at the top oh, yeah. and we well, went too down scared to go back down too scared to go back down. it was petrifying oh, no. like it was you if you look down i mean it's, but is it do you, when you go back down presumably you have to climb backwards like you're descending a ladder yeah mm. right exactly with much more of an angle i guess yeah and here's the thing there was no system whereby you would go up one way and come down the other oh sure you would bump into people oh, coming kidding. up on the way yeah yeah so, so you would, would have, you have to, to go all the way back up like if you're only 40 percent of the way down and they're 60 percent of the way up is it like you have to climb all the way back up to the top i remember shimmying past someone who leaned into the tree. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It does sound horrific, this. I mean, I would absolutely love to do it. But the, also, why did you call it the Gloucester tree? Is that what they call it in Australia? No, I'd probably just pronounce that weirdly, hey. Well, I thought maybe all Australians do because they can't pronounce, you know, <laughs> English place Gloucester, names. Think, Gloucester, right? yeah. It would have been the Gloucester tree. I certainly have called it the Gloucester tree. I was once skiing with my in-laws and um, I was at the top and I, didn't, I don't like other people seeing me skiing because I'm so bad at it and I get really embarrassed because I keep falling over and stuff. And my father-in-law went down the first bit and then he stopped. I'm like, oh, fuck's sake, he's waiting for me because he's trying to be polite and he wants to wait. So anyway, I was like, I'm not going. I'm not going. So I waited at the top and I waited at the top for about 40 minutes. And then eventually he went down and then I kind of followed him down. And then I spoke to him afterwards and he said he was too scared to go back down and he was just trying to get up the courage to go down. And I thought that he was... You know, spying. just yeah, spying to see if I was going to fall over. <laughs> God, that's so funny. Guys. That's very. <laughs> that's such a, that's such a weird situation. <laughs> <laughs> just all the women in the family at the bottom going, "Why? What are those two doing?" That is a moment where you go to Polina. You've married your father. That's <laughs> yeah, just... yeah, yeah. There was there was a mountaineer who made kit out of balloon material. So George Finch. Uh, was an, Auss- an Aussie mountain climber and he went on the Mallory expedition in 1922 yeah. and invented the uh, Ida down coat, the puffer jacket essentially mm-hmm. from hot air balloon material mm-hmm. when everyone else on the trip was wearing tweed so <laughs> it's a really radical yeah. thing to imagine cool. and all the other mountaineers laughed at him, it's really you know. He was wearing way. a basket on his feet as well, though, <laughs> But imagine being laughed at by a lot of people wearing tweed. I know <laughs> um, sounds like my school days um, <laughs> He, he and he was really looked down on by the other mountaineers. So he was observed repairing his own boots. Very, you know, very unclassy behaviour. And the deputy leader of the expedition, who was called Colonel Edward Strutt, said, "I always knew the fellow was a shit." <laughs> Just because he's invented a new jacket and he's clean repaired his own boots. What a way with words this guy had. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah, but he had the last laugh because obviously no wind got through his amazing jacket, and yeah. he was he was feeling a lot warmer. Yeah. So today, there's still something like 500 lookouts in America, and they reckon it's a 50-50 split of men yeah. and women. Yeah. And they reckon it kind of was that, in not the very earliest period, but 
but as soon as the sort of ceiling was broke and the first woman started doing it which was this lady who was called Hallie Morse Daggett and she became the first female to serve in the forest service and mm. it's an amazing recommendation that she got in order did you read that letter yeah, it's, uh, so yeah. cool. it's incredible this guy who was the ranger he wrote a letter to his boss saying that he thought that Daggett would be the best person for the job but obviously there were three people applying and two of them were men it should have gone to one of them and certainly should it, yeah. I agree <laughs> Okay, no, I, I think we can all agree on that. Then. No, 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 I'm backtracking. <laughs> no, so, how on. on earth did this woman get the job? I don't understand. So, I'm still furious about this. <laughs> Uh, so what he, what he wrote in the letter was the novelty of the proposition which has been unloaded upon me and which I am now endeavoring to pass up to you may perhaps take your breath away like just like even that thought alone yeah, yeah. like the bit at the end where he, he said she is absolutely devoid of the timidity which is ordinarily associated with her sex mm. yeah mm. okay uh, but she's not afraid of anything that walks creeps or flies she is a perfect lady in every respect wow yeah. that's a perfect lady um general motors oh, yeah. they make artificial stalactites out of their car byproducts weird, pretty cool right? and pretty weird yeah. for, for where for, for nature. bats yeah Cool. For bats yeah. to cling on to. So they've they've installed a couple of hundred of these across the USA. They put them in caves because it gives the bats more surface area to spread out um, and hang from. And that means when the bats have more space, they don't all cluster together. Because when they cluster together, they spread this disease amongst themselves called white nose syndrome, oh, which yeah. is kind of fungus. Mm. That's very bad for the bats. And as we know, if we've learned anything... It's that you should try and keep the bats healthy. Um, <laughs> and so General Motors have started installing these. Right. Yeah. Yeah. What do they... I thought you were going to say there was some sort of amazing benefit for General Motors as a company to do PR. this. PR. Just PR, The, the right. intangible benefits yeah. of PR are okay. huge, Dan. I mean, listen, the, listen, the, I'm talking about them now. Yeah. General yeah. Motors. Ooh. <laughs> and the bats great. tell their other bat friends and they tell their other bat friends and before you know it... There we go. Is yeah. the car market big in the bat world? Do they particularly yeah, like... Yeah, the Batmobile. Yeah. Come on. Good point. Yeah. It's just the one model, isn't it? That's true. <laughs> um, You'll get letters. There are loads of models. There oh are my God. There are dozens of models in the Batmobile. Sorry. No, thank you for saving me because I, oh I saw you think about letting me drop myself in that. <laughs> Stop the podcast. Stop the podcast. Hey, everyone. This week's episode of Fish is sponsored by Grind Coffee. Oh, Grind Coffee, yes. Grind Coffee. I had a couple of grinds this morning, so to speak. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and Grind is just a really, really tasty coffee, a really awesome coffee, a really sustainable coffee. And I have an espresso machine at home, and I can use their compostable coffee pods to make sure that not only do I get a tasty cup of coffee, but also they don't go into the landfill. They go into my compost heap. Mm. Sorry, James. Just having a sip of my grind coffee as we speak. That's true. Listen, this is a crazy stat, but every minute, 29,000 plastic and aluminium coffee pods go into landfill. So over the course of a year, that's 120,000 tons of waste. It's absolutely insane. Grind Coffee is trying to do something about that. And so they use 100% plastic-free pods so that they'll break down in weeks rather than literally centuries 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 and you can get your first 30 compostable coffee pods for just five pounds by going to grind.co.uk and using the code fish at checkout that's over 60 percent off your cup of coffee that's right so head to grind.co.uk and if you use the offer code fish at the checkout you're going to get your first 30 compostable coffee pods for just five pounds and you'll also be getting, and this is the real reason I go to grind, a pink refillable grind tin. Ugh, I've got like five now. I love them. That's not the point of refillable things, Dad. You don't just collect loads of them. You get one and you refill it. That's true, but we use it for so many other things that we can now refill. Okay, so, you know, it's okay. because it's our go-to place for refill objects. <laughs> uh, anyway, that's 60% off the perfect cup of coffee in your home. Do go and get it now. Okay, on with the podcast. On with the show. There's an old wives' tale that you tell if something is a fossil by licking it. Oh, yeah. Is it supposed to, like, have air holes and it's, like, stickier to your tongue or something? I've got to tell you, I've been on so many archaeological sites and once in a while, like, some of the undergrads will be like, <laughs> like, nobody knows what on earth it means. They've just got stone to their tongues. It's I don't think oh, it's very interesting. But, what, but what's the idea? What, As in, what are you meant to get from it that people It's are supposed doing to be it? different. I think it's supposed to stick more yeah, if it's it actually a fossil. It's supposed but to be like um, 
It's not. Oh, what is it now? It's like supposed to have little tiny holes in it that when you put your tongue into it, it kind of sticks to your tongue. And I worry very much that your undergrads might have heard this on QI. <laughs> <laughs> I think we oh might my god, have, I think you're right. We might have a retraction to make if that's not true. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We punks your undergrads accidentally. And I'm sorry. No, it just it's not very the best method is actually just to see if it will break apart, which is kind of similar with the crop because if it's if it's bone, it will just snap. But obviously you don't really want to be snapping fossils, uh, for obvious reasons. Yeah. But um yeah. I've, de- I've definitely then been on archaeological. I've got two fossils then if you do that. <laughs> Perfect. Charged up. You're not coming with me on a dig, James. <laughs> <laughs> what we found 16 finds <laughs> i swear we started with eight um but no is it yeah i was on an expedition and uh, and they were like and we have this massive argument about if something was a was a fossil or a stone and um and i might have accidentally dropped it and it made such a loud noise we were like that's a stone that's a stone <laughs> but then another time a professor was massively arguing with me and i was like i swear it's a fossil as you can tell i think everything is a fossil <laughs> even when it's stone and he was like no it's not it's a stone it's a stone and then he went look you can't break it and then he broke it and he was like oh let's just pretend that never happened (laughs) (laughs) so much history destroyed (laughs) by the professor that was the best bit but yeah the other marine worms do that kind of dissolving thing don't they there's a worm called the zombie worm which feeds off skeletons of mostly whales but other dead ocean animals at the bottom of the sea and that sends acid out onto the bone which kind of melts it well wow. dissolve, dissolves it and then they just live inside whale bones forever and ever and they're really cool the thing i like about them is that the males just live inside the females forever so there'll be one female and then they'll have about 100 males living inside no them. really yeah. and they just live there and they feed off her yolk of her eggs yeah and then eventually they inseminate her because they thought they did they were looking for the males, right? Because yeah. they knew they found the sperm inside the females. Right. So they were like, well, where are the males? And it turned out the sperm was the males. No. <laughs> so it's like they're the little guys who live inside the female. That's incredible. Do the males ever leave the female and find their own, a new female? Do they ever break up? I don't think, I think you haven't got a choice. It's very much an arranged marriage sort of situation. <laughs> but what about when the new, <laughs> what about the, when the female gives birth or when the, she lays eggs that then hatch? Yeah, they must have to, fl- they, have to swim around to find another female, how do presumably. They, yeah. Do they get the when they hatch the, when a female hatches mm-hmm. as in when a female one of these fish hatches do they how do they get new males i guess yeah you're right they I just swim they around f- and they find, find other, them oh yeah i don't actually know uh they probably just look for some tasty bones where everyone else is hanging around yeah. that's where the term boning comes from <laughs> no, what what am i talking about the interesting <laughs> thing is that um they do they live on a um on whale bones yeah but also they've been found living on like the food the bones of the food that people wow. throw on the bars. Really? Yeah. That's and that is where the phrase throw me a bone comes from. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> yeah. There was lots of reasons that people ca- uh, climb Mont Blanc. This was from a book called Killing Dragons, The Conquest of the Alps by Fergus Fleming. Um, in 1818, there was a Russian count called Matsevsky um, who did it because he wanted to improve his poetry skills. Hmm. <laughs> so, oh. Yeah, do you think? No. Oh, I don't know. What's he practicing there? Is it the writing of? Is it the speaking? I think of he's poetry? thinking seeing all that beauty yes. will help yeah, my poetry. I kind of I think think that that. That. Being inspired by amazing stuff. Because there is a, a Shelley poem called Mont Blanc, which is, is there? one of the worst Shelley poems is it? in what existence. Is it? What does he rhyme with Blanc? <laughs> <laughs> Blanc Monde. <laughs> there was someone I knew had a tutor who, you know, an English literature tutor who said. Uh, poetry uh, is better than sex, apart from Shelley's Mont Blanc. Sex is better than Mont Blanc. <laughs> wow. yeah. um, there was a guy called uh, John Oljo, and he climbed because he wanted to see a better reflection of the mountain in the lake. Wow. So he thought he couldn't see it properly from the ground, so he had to go to the top so he was able did, to see it. How did you right. know the lake was there if it was halfway up Strange, the mountain? Strange, isn't it? And yeah. also, can you really see the mountain reflection from a lake that's below you? Maybe you can. I don't know. There was a guy called Comte Henri de Tilly uh, who climbed because he wanted to cheer himself up after a failed affair. Uh, and there was a guy called Edward Bootle Wilbraham who <laughs> climbed Mont Blanc because he had been told not to. Cool. That's, wow. That's was literally a, all I know about it. Yeah. Was he an eight-year-old in a strop? <laughs> what have you done? <laughs> isn't that amazing? It's like impressive. proper reverse psychology, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Don't climb that mountain. It's mad. <laughs> is bigger. Do you think the tallest curtains ever made are taller than the widest curtains ever made are wide? Okay. Or do you, no. Do you th- no. I would think width is easier to make than height. 
Done. I'm going to go height. Okay. Well, Why? the 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 obvious answer is I'm afraid the correct one here. <laughs> uh, I, I wish I could have some kind of exclusive minority report for you, but no, the tallest curtains are are, are only half as high as the widest curtains are wide. That's actually still a surprisingly large proportion of the widest curtains. Yeah. That's quite tall. Also, so, well, they're 65 metres tall. I mean, that's incredible. Also, all you need to do is just flip it the other way up and then you've got the tallest curtain. Yeah, that's a really good point. Just turn your <laughs> landscape curtains into portrait <laughs> curtains and they're much taller. There has been a new kind of paper invented uh, made from biomaterials. So you take like... Um, parts of people's body and you kind of squish it down and do a load of chemical stuff to it and you can get get this new kind of paper and the idea is that they can use it by kind of folding it into certain ways and it'll help to heal wounds or it'll help the body to regenerate organ tissue stuff like that so it's a way of using origami inside the human body Mm. and it's really interesting the way they discovered this there's a guy called adam jacus uh, and it's one of those discoveries where it was an accidental discovery um, because he, <laughs> he'd he actually created an ink made from an ovary that he was going to use for a 3D printer and he spilled the ink uh, and it kind of hardened and turned into this paper and he realised that he could use it and I know there are more questions to be asked yeah. from the start of that sentence. <laughs> sure. we, yeah. You saw questions appear on our faces one <laughs> after the other. What but, ovary? Yeah. Well, that's the way that they make these biomaterials is they take um, body parts from people. Is it a human ovary? Human o- oh, um, right. Actually, I think it was a pig ovary, this one. But the I hope think. is in okay. the future they'll be able to use human body parts as well or so, maybe stem cells to create them. So is the idea that you would sacrifice, let's say, a finger, but you would get a cool new power? No. That, that, no, no, that's no. Not, it's I, almost I, like you haven't understood anything <laughs> I've said. <laughs> <laughs> It's more like you would get stem cells to create some kind of um, biomaterials yeah. and then that would turn into a paper kind of material and you'd be able to fold it and help to like cover wounds or... Or swallow it and it springs into a fake heart inside you or something. That, that is closer to what might happen than what Andy said. Yeah, for but sure. If you, if you, if you, James said you can make it from a body part. So if in yeah. extremis, you cut off your own finger. Yeah, but you'd only be using the finger to make some paper bandage to put over that wound yeah, you'll of be, the missing finger. Oh, I see. I see. It's a <laughs> yeah. problem that's solving its own it's creation. It's a false economy, really. Yeah, 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 yeah. you're right. Yeah. Pretty cool, though. Yeah. Amazing. <laughs> Until the 70s and 80s, a lot of geographers assumed that elephants couldn't swim. Mm. And so when you found elephant bones on an island, there must have been a land bridge because otherwise there's no way they could have got across. There's a debate about how elephants got to Sri Lanka, isn't there? Yeah. And lots of other places used to have elephants like Malta and Crete and Cyprus. Yes. None of which I think I think have elephants now. No. I've been to Malta and it's it's quite a small island. You you would struggle to hide a, a wild elephant population on it. They yeah. also they have um, British home stores there, don't they? Which is yes, um, they it's an extinct shop in the UK, but it still goes on in Malta. Do you reckon there was a land bridge once from the UK to Malta where British <laughs> they, British they home stores across, <laughs> <laughs> frantically was... taking their, their reasonably priced uh, outer rain garments <laughs> with them? God, you're right. Malta is one of those funny places, though, because they've got a they've got a BHS. Uh, they've still got a mother care. Yeah, I don't think there's a mother oh. care on the British mainland anymore. And it's just like that thing where, you know, a species goes extinct on the mainland, but it survives on the island. Yeah, but the thing no is, contact. because it's an island, they get either very very big or very very small. So yeah. the, the mother care is really tiny, whereas the British home stars is massive. <laughs> That's so funny. Do you know, when I got there, when I got to Malta, I, I shared a cab from the airport with, to the main town because the, some guy just approached me and said, do you want to share a cab? And and then he turned out, he said he didn't have any money. It was all a bit dodgy. Um, <laughs> but he... <laughs> you've, you've been duped, my friend. <laughs> well, he was a really peculiar guy because he said he was there for some kind of corporate espionage purposes. Oh, yeah. Right. And he said that's what he does. And he goes around to make sure that, for example, the Maltese mother care aren't selling. He's probably from yeah. Chinese home stars. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> it was so unclear what he was doing. And then he found out I had some kind of job in the media and he, cl- he didn't say a word for the rest of the journey, really? except to clarify perhaps that he didn't have any money to pay for the cab at the end of it. Sounds like he really <laughs> didn't want you to mention him publicly. So it's a good thing that this will be going out to a few hundred thousand people. Um, I have I have one last thing, which is I think I have found the only coprolite street in the world. Okay, what do you mean? Like it's paved with poo? 
No. No, it's called it's called Copper Light Street. Oh. Is it? the, as far as I can tell, I've gone on Google Maps and I've put Copper Light in, and there's only <laughs> one place in the world that has it on its sign. <laughs> is it and in Lyme a, Regis or no? It's in Ipswich. Oh. Um is it? yeah. Which is in Suffolk uh, for anyone overseas listening. And um, yeah, it's um, Copperlight Street. It was named that because there was a guy called Edward Packer who started basically a fossil feces factory, burning it up and using the energy. Um, he was known as the Golden Muckman of Ipswich or the, cop- <laughs> <laughs> the Copperlight King. Yeah, the <laughs> Copperlight King. Man, what a great name. Where are they finding enough fossils to? Yeah. Build- well, I guess back in the day, in the 1800s, they're everywhere, right? Somewhere near Ipswich, I guess. <laughs> Norwich? No. <laughs> this is, I can't believe the way you research, Dan, is you just type in all the keywords that we're researching that week into Google Maps to see if there are places named after them. <laughs> Anna, yeah. do you think this is genius or, or are you just disappointed with your teammate? I wish I'd thought of it first. <laughs> Seven years, it's finally paid off. Copper lights. Yeah. You would have thought. <laughs> the only one in the world. Looking at that list, that massive list of copper light facts, I just imagine Dan being like, yeah, we're running out of facts. So <laughs> she's going to not Google it. I'm going to literally Google Earth it. Yeah. <laughs> you think outside of the box here. <laughs> Okay, that's it. That's all of our facts. Thank you so much for listening. If you would like to speak to me, you can go to Twitter and you can look for at James Harkin and I will be there. If you would like to speak to Andrew Hunter Murray, you can go to at Andrew Hunter M on that very same website. And Dan is there as well at Schreiberland. If you would like to speak to Anna, you can email her or indeed any of us on the address podcast at qi.com. And if you'd like to learn more about the podcast, you can go to no such thing as a fish.com. And that is also the place where you can get tickets to the shows, which I mentioned at the top of this show. The easier place to go for those as well is qi.com slash fish events. We will be back again next week with another episode of No Such Things A Fish, another normal episode. But in the meantime, hope you enjoy your bank holiday weekend if you're in the UK and wherever you are in the world, hope you're having a great time. We will see you again next week. Goodbye. Goodbye.